In studio with Senator Jason Barrett, Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey. Man, I am surrounded by some big-time, powerful people here. Today. You know, I think this is probably the lowest average age of this room for a co-host <laughs> in quite some time. Yeah, yeah, that's the truth, man. Uh, I can't. I can't think of uh, of too many. In the, when Alonzo was here, because he's like twenty seven years old, when he hosted oh, yeah. a couple times. Uh, but otherwise, but I, when you when you put him in here with Stubblefield, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it balances out. Right. It washes out. Yeah. It averages out. But you're getting older every day, Barrett. Uh, as a matter of fact, I turned forty one this past Sunday. Congratulations! So. Happy Thank birthday you. to you. Thank you. Where Thank where are you on the age spectrum, Harvey? Hi. I'm here. Uh, I'm, uh, I will turn chicken. 46 in, in August. Yeah, in, enjoy your 40s. I remember them, I think. They were a little while They're ago. They're great. Here they are. 50s aren't horrible, but stuff starts to catch up to you in that decade. Yeah, all those bad decisions <laughs> that you made when you were 20 and 30. A lot of the guys that I play golf with are considerably older than I am, and I get reminded um, on Wednesdays when we play golf that it only gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't get any better. It only gets worse. But but it beats the alternative. Uh, maybe. Uh, at uh, nine thirty six, we welcome in Mark Serber. He's younger than either one of you two guys. Mark, how old are you? Thirty eight, I think. I stopped counting a while ago. You're thirty eight. Has it been that long? Yeah. I, I, yep. Didn't I know you when you were like twenty three? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, time flew, man. Hey, 38's still good, though. It makes you younger than Barrett and Harvey, so you're still... Uh... Hey, thanks for joining us, Mark. <laughs> hey, I'm, I am enjoying 38. No complaints. My friend uh, Mark Serber, I used to work uh, soccer matches with him in uh, Rockville for a uh, minor league, uh, uh, for Colorado Rapids minor league uh, team that used to play out of Rockville, and Mark went on to a great career with the Fox Soccer Channel. He is one of the best soccer uh, people that I know, and whenever I have uh, stuff I want to talk soccer, I go to this guy right here. He's my go-to guy for the beautiful game. So, Mark, let's talk Women's World Cup. The United States plays their first match against Vietnam tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. As I look over the, the women's national team roster, there's still a few familiar names, but some of those, uh, some of those glorious names have retired and moved on here. Tell me about this squad. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be fascinating because it's really a changing of the guard. You know, the last two World Cups, we kind of knew who the core of the team was. This time around, there's 14 players at their first World Cup. And then you also have some injuries that you're dealing with. We're missing the likes of Captain Becky Sauerbrunn, Sam Mewis, Mallory Swanson, Christian Press, and Katarino Macario. So, you know, some of the top players are really missing. And then uh, they took a squad that doesn't really have a backup for Alex Morgan. So if she's off or having a bad tournament, that's going to be interesting as well. But they do have some really good forwards in Lynn Williams and um, Trinity Rodman, who I'm really excited to see uh, those two come to the fore as well as everybody's been talking about Sophia Smith and expecting her to have a breakout tournament. But it's going to be really interesting to see as this is a side with the chance to become the first team on the men's or women's side to win three consecutive World Cups. Where are they holding the World Cup for women this year? It's in New Zealand and Australia, which makes for some terrible viewing times here in the U.S. Right? Mm -hmm. The games start at 3 a.m. in the morning um, and uh, some summer at 9 p.m. at night. But, uh, yeah, if you're, you're a fan of the beautiful game. And uh, as you know, we've done it before with the men's tournament in South Korea and uh, Japan. And you just you wake up early and get through it and a lot of coffee the next day. Luckily, the women's first game is uh, 9 p.m. on Friday evening, so it should be a good time for everyone. The United States is in a bracket with Vietnam, the Netherlands, and Portugal. Who's the strongest of that group? It's going to be the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands, obviously, were the, the, the runner-up against the U.S. in the, the 2019 World Cup. Um, they have a bit of a new team, and so they're not exactly the same, but they're still one of the top teams in Europe, and they're, they're going to be very strong opponents. Um, Portugal will be very strong as well, but the U.S. is expected to top this group. And in the world, who would be the United States and Netherlands' biggest competition? Oh, there's a lot of competition. As as you know, we've talked about this a lot. The women's game has just gotten stronger and stronger. The, the really big ones are England, who won the last Euros. Uh, you have Canada, who were the gold medal um, winners in the, in the last Olympics. However, they're struggling with some off-the-field stuff, so it'll be interesting to see how they cope. And then um, France has been absolutely dynamite as well, and I think they're going to at least be semifinalists, uh, if not a chance to be the winners. The host, Australia, 
uh, not only have their home support, but they just beat France in a friendly. They're the best they've ever been. And they have in um, the best player in the world, possibly, in uh, Sam Kerr. So they're a dominant side. And then the last one I'd mention is Brazil. They have Marta, obviously, playing in her sixth World Cup. And they have a really good young up-and-coming squad. Some say it might be too early for them this time around with the squad they have. But they also have former U.S. uh, World Cup winning head coach and Pia Sunhaga. And she can work wonders with any team, especially with the talent Brazil has. So as you can see, it's, it's a really big pool. And once the U.S. get to the knockout stages... Every single game is going to be a battle, and it's going to be really tough for them, and they're not going to cruise through anything once this becomes a, a knockout uh, format. I haven't seen Marta play in a few years, but I do remember Marta in her peak, and as is the case with many Brazilians, she was sick, skilled, and amazing, and at one time the best player in the world. What percentage of Marta's peak will we see in this her sixth World Cup? I mean, she's ageless, right? Uh, She still has those skills. Maybe she's not, you know, at the peak, but, you know, she's only maybe lost about 10% over time. And the other thing about her, she's just such an incredible leader. Uh, And she really riles up this Brazil squad and really gets the the rest of the players to get on her level, as as all great leaders do. So I still think you're going to see some magic from Marta in this, her sixth and final World Cup. Norway was upset yesterday. You were talking about the overall strength of this field. That had to surprise a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. New Zealand obviously has the the host support, but at the same time, they've never won a World Cup match. So it's really exciting because they weren't predicted to get out of this group. And now all of a sudden, they're the one possible win that everybody was expecting was against the Philippines. And all of a sudden, that game for New Zealand, if they're able to win that, and they're in the knockout phase, which nobody had predicted. So, Already, this World Cup is is off to a great start, and Australia also getting a tough-fought one-nothing victory over the Republic of Ireland, who's very strong as well. And that game could have gone either way, too. It was a penalty that decided it in the end. So I think the tournament was expanded to 32 teams, and there's still a huge golfing class between the top, top teams and the bottom teams. So you may see some lopsided games, but at the same time, the amount of teams that have moved into the upper echelons has been exponential from what we've seen even four years ago. So this is really, really exciting um, for this World Cup and the women's game as a whole as it just continues to develop at a rapid pace across the world. Senator Jason Barrett. Hey, Mark. Uh, good morning. I want to switch gears on you a little bit. I mean, it's still soccer related, but um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, over the past several years, the interest uh, in soccer, specifically uh women's soccer it's been fantastic Uh, yeah i think the the biggest thing is here in the u.s there's always been a really great pipeline um but it's only gotten stronger in terms of the way that we develop players and the opportunities uh, afforded to the women i think the difference between here and the rest of the world is that the players would go to college and go pro uh and now you're seeing some players that are are going pro straight out of high school or even younger than that. And I understand that we're an education first country, but at the same time, in terms of soccer, when you have players in France and in England who are growing pro at 16, 17, then when you go to college and then you go pro, you know, you're coming in at 22 as a rookie against players who've, who've been pros and have lived that pro life and have gotten that, you know, pro coaching and experience for up to five, six, seven years already. And so, that's where the U.S. was, was kind of falling behind a bit. Um, but now that that structure is in place here in the U.S., that that's going to help the U.S. to maintain its competitive advantage at the top. And across the world, in terms of the uh, excitement and, and development of women's soccer, more uh, professional leagues have been added and more countries have been pipe, uh, piping more money into the women's game and also developing those pipelines and giving more opportunities for for younger women to play and almost more importantly than that is also changing some of the cultural stereotypes against young women who wanted to play soccer and so now it's it's more mainstream it's not only accepted but it's greatly supported and it's been really exciting and in one way you fear for the U.S. and kind of losing its grip on its dominance but in another way it's just made the game that much more exhilarating. 
The, obviously, there's more interest from athletes, as you just mentioned. Is the viewership uh, in the United States, uh, has that increased over the past several years as it relates to, to the World Cup? Absolutely. You always see a spike come World Cup time, whether it's on the, the men's side or the women's side. Uh, so that spike is definitely going to be there. And at the same time, though, it's it's the viewership for the NWSL. It's it's the viewership of people tuning into leagues in, in England and in Spain. Uh, here in the U.S. Um, so that has definitely risen, and you'll you'll see another spike. And even bars, uh, I know here in D.C. and probably other metropolitan areas, have been given special dispensation um, to stay open 24 hours so that patrons can come and watch the games there. With sports wagering being legal in 29 states now, do you think that that, that is playing some role in the increased viewership across the United States? It definitely has to. I think... You know, when you're a betting fan, you'll always kind of find something to bet on, and this is definitely an intriguing prospect to bet on. Um, and I think that just opens up another avenue and opens up the game to more people that might not have paid attention to it before. And and soccer, as I'm sure you're aware, is is the most wagered on sport uh, in the world. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the integrity of, of the games, uh, not only with athletes, but specifically with uh, officials, um, you know, and, and what all goes into to protecting that integrity to ensure that, um, you know, games aren't being thrown, that, that calls aren't being made, um, you know, to sway, uh, you know, particular lines uh, on on a game? Oh, man, uh, how much time do we have in this segment? <laughs> uh, you got 13 uh, minutes left. <laughs> yeah, so – that's a fascinating question. I'd say this is that at the top level, there are a lot of mechanisms in place to maintain the integrity uh, on the field. Uh, it might be different off the field in terms of the inner, what, what happens behind the scenes at FIFA, as we all know. But on the field, there are a lot of mechanisms in place. Um, not to, to bring this to the men's side, but there was just a player in England who was suspended for almost you know, three quarters of a year uh, for betting on the game. Um, the, the, there are a lot of mechanisms and leverages in place um, to, to make sure to, that that doesn't happen. Where you generally see that is in the lower levels of the game, and that's because players are on much lower salaries, so they're more susceptible to possibly taking bribes. And the um, kind of watchdogs aren't necessarily looking for uh, irregular betting patterns in you know fourth fifth sixth division games uh so every once in a while you'll hear a wild story about a team winning by like 30 goals or a game being thrown in the lower divisions but i don't think you really have to worry about that kind of in the first and second divisions around the world and especially don't have to worry about that at the fifa world cups matt harvey good morning mark um it is famously Megan Rapino's last World Cup. Uh, she's 38 years old, and she has been um, probably the most visible women's player in a long time. What do you expect to see out of her this tournament? She's going to come in in a super sub role uh, in that sort of capacity, and she still has the ability to change a game on its head. She has that moment of quality, that moment of magic, and I think that's where she's really going to excel. And she's accepted that. You know, a lot of players – who have had the kind of career that Rapino has had, they really struggle with having to kind of take on and adopt that role. And sometimes that causes some disharmony and distress in the dressing room. But Rapino, who has not only been a sensational player her whole career, but a wonderful leader, has fully embraced that. And I think that that's going to really help the U.S. Uh, she obviously doesn't have kind of the legs for the, the 90 minutes, but she's going to come on with the um, you, the opportunity to change change games and hopefully head coach uh, Blanco and Andonofsky can insert her at the right times, the most opportune times to turn games on their head or swing them in the U.S.'s favor, put them downhill to victory. So with her experience, she has a, there's a lot of uh, young players on this team with no World Cup experience. You think that her experience will help spill over and, and steady the ship? Absolutely, because she knows that she's there not only to play and not only to come in and score those goals, but she knows she's there in a, a mentorship capacity as well. And she's uh, just a great example of how she trains, how she approaches everything, um, how she gets ready for, for every single game and takes care of herself. 
and the younger players are definitely going to be looking up to that and trying to emulate it throughout the tournament. Do you think that, um, or what's next for her then after this tournament? Does she go into coaching? Um, does she become a commentator? Run for office? Does she run for office? She can move to West Virginia and run for office? Everybody, I mean, the, she's not going to win in West Virginia. No, she's not. <laughs> yeah. I haven't really read or, or seen too much, and this is my naivety here as to kind of what her plans are. She could very well, you know, still play for a few years in NWSL or wherever she wants, and then you know, whether she wants to go into to coaching or commentary or, like you said, political office, whatever she wants to do, she she certainly earned it and have earned her stripes to move into kind of any of those fields. Can I, not related to women's soccer, but but could be related, not directly related, is the signing of of Messi for what Inter Milan or Inter Miami? Um, do you see a renaissance like a, a renaissance of soccer with Wrexham you know, being very popular on Netflix and now Messi coming to America to play? Do you see new uncharted territory for the popularity of soccer in America? I do. I think it's. It stems from the fact that people who have never paid attention to MLS before are going to pay attention to it now. Uh, you have, obviously, a large uh, Latino community here in the U.S., and especially in Miami, where the majority of Argentinians that are in this country live. And people who've never turned uh, tuned into MLS games before are going to tune into it. But the, the more of the ripple effect is people around the world who are now going to tune into MLS, who are going to learn about the league, who are going to watch games for the first time. Um, that's the effect that, that Messi is going to have. If you remember the effect that Beckham had on the league 10 years ago, or, geez, more than that now, um, while a long time ago, this is going to be times three, the effect uh, that Beckham had. Uh, it's also going to increase... You know, the, the TV ratings, the TV revenue. And then on top of that, uh, it's going to be a renaissance for Inner Miami. I don't think they've won a game since May. So now having Messi, they have an opportunity to charge up the table as well. Just to give you an idea, before people even knew when he was coming or when his first game was going to be played, I believe that the bottom tickets went from the single digits to over $500. And now every game that Messi or Inter Miami's going to play in before people even knew when he was coming had sold out within the first few days. And then you just think about the jersey sales alone and how many people who've never even watched MLS are going to buy an Inter Miami uh, Messi jersey and all those people who love MLS who are going to buy an Inter Miami Messi jersey. Um, it, it's just going to catapult the league in, in so many different um, stratospheres from the TV to world recognition to the revenue that it's going to drive. On the heels of the success of Ted Lasso, which will not have a fourth season with Jason Sudeikis, it couldn't have been better timing. I think I think Messi just made sure he filled the void. Ted Lasso is going to leave uh, behind there. Uh, in, in all seriousness, Mark, uh, the women have made all eight semifinals of all eight World Cups played so far. They've won four of them. I'm going to throw a name out there. Brandy Chastain, her birthday is tomorrow. She'll be 55 years old, and she scored arguably the most famous goal in women's World Cup history in 1999 to secure the World Cup. Uh, Mark, you were a pretty young pup at that time, but I know you remember that as well. Uh, this, uh, that goal put women's soccer in America in a different category. Absolutely. It's, it's when young players, because we, we all know that the, the first thing we all do with our kids is put them into soccer, whether it's, it's boys or girls. But, you know, it, it's about the majority of them stopping at, at 10, 11, or 12 and going to other sports. And that's the first time that young uh, women, girls and young women all across the country could begin to dream that there was an opportunity to continue playing beyond high school and then even beyond college. And so, that just catapulted us and got the ball rolling down the hill to where we are today, where we're going to see one of the most exciting and skillful women's World Cups in history. You remember after she scored the goal, she took off her game jersey and she had a sports bra underneath, and the country freaked out. At least a, a bunch of the country freaked out over her on TV wearing a sports bra, which I didn't. I didn't get the overreaction then, and I, 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 I'm sure even looking back on it, I still don't understand it. But it was one of the more famous photos of that era. 
You know, I think it was just a moment of pure jubilation and pure ecstasy. And uh, my favorite conspiracy theory about that was I believe it was Nike sports bra. And so people are saying, oh, you know, she did it, you know, because it's, it's Nike and blah, blah, blah. And my thought was in that moment, you've just scored a penalty in front of 90,000 people plus millions watching around the world to win a World Cup. Are you really going to think about your sponsorship? Right. Right. I wouldn't blame her if she did. <laughs> but if she did, it was a great moment and, uh, and good for her because it made her incredibly famous as well. Uh, let's get some predictions now for this Women's World Cup here. Mark, what are you thinking? Yeah, I really hope the U.S. wins. They're going to have a really tough time, uh, even just in the round of 16, possibility to play either France or Brazil. So once you enter the knockout stages, it's going to be extremely tough. Um, my top three to, to win is either going to be the U.S., England, or France. Um, but, you know, don't sleep on um, Australia, Canada, and, and even Spain as well. Uh, will, Brazil, too. Will this Vietnam match on Friday night be close? Don't think so. Uh, you remember the Thailand uh, game to, to open the last World Cup? Mm -hmm. I believe it was a 13 nothing score. I think that's what you're going to see. And uh, whether or not, you know, they celebrate the way they did last time, which which I love because I think it just got all the momentum and, and confidence and that little bit of arrogance that you need in a tournament like this um, going. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be a, a 13 nothing game, but I would be surprised if the U.S. at least put up four. Mark, thanks so much. Appreciate your time this morning. Always great to talk soccer with you. It's always a pleasure speaking with you.